So um, I had a sermon prepared, and I had a direction for a sermon, and we're going to go a different way. Uh, we'll see where this goes, but um, there was uh, some news this week, actually over the last couple of weeks, um, that, that I feel like the church has to address. And um, I, I want to take some time, and we'll, we'll kind of weave this into our series. We're, we're in a series called I Believe, talking about the Apostles' Creed. And we'll weave it into this um, somehow. But uh, I want to talk about what's been happening in the news. Because if the church doesn't talk about what's kind of happening within our ranks, and acknowledge, and lament, and reflect... Uh, then we're doing a great disservice not only to the God we worship, but also to the world that we serve. And uh, maybe you know nothing about what I'm going to be talking about, but here, here's a, a, a brief video that will give you kind of uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a backstory um, of, of what happened this week. We are going to begin here with what appears to be the largest abuse scandal to shake the American Catholic Church yet. After a two-year investigation, a Pennsylvania grand jury today alleged decades of abuse of children by more than 300 men described as predator priests. It detailed the accounts of more than 1,000 children, but said there are likely thousands more victims. And the report says church leaders protected the priests in a cover-up that went all the way to the Vatican. Nikki Batiste is in Harrisburg. Priests were rape raping little boys and girls, and the men of God who were responsible for them not only did nothing, they hid it all for decades. Standing alongside survivors of sexual abuse, Attorney General Josh Attorney General. Shapiro said the grand jury uncovered credible evidence against 301 predator priests who abused more than 1,000 children. The time of telling these victims to keep their truth to themselves has ended. The grand jury investigation goes back 70 years and identified predator priests in six Catholic dioceses across Pennsylvania. Documents from the diocese's own secret archives form the backbone of the investigation, corroborating accounts of alleged sexual abuse and systemic church cover-up, mirroring a worldwide pattern where abusers are moved from parish to parish. We should emphasize that while the list of priests is long, we don't think we got them all. We feel certain that many victims never came forward and that the diocese did not create written records every single time they heard something about abuse. Nearly 100 of the accused clergy are from the Pittsburgh Diocese alone, where Donald Worrell, the current Cardinal of Washington, D.C., was the bishop for 18 years. Do you think right now, today, children are being abused at the hands of priests in the Catholic Church? I'm not sure that there's any way you can guarantee that there won't ever be a failure in the life of any priest going into the future. You can't do more than give your very best to trying to eradicate a problem. For the victims here today, Pennsylvania's statute of limitations makes their cases too old to be prosecuted. Would an elimination of the statute of limitations be justice for the victims? There should be no statute of limitations to bring criminal charges in Pennsylvania when it comes to child sexual abuse. The majority of the named priests are dead. Still, as a result of the investigation, two priests have been criminally charged, including one who has pled guilty. This is the priest you say abused you? Yes. John face. Doherty was molested by his family priest for two years, beginning at age 10. Is this report enough vindication, or are you fighting to change laws? This report is just the beginning battle of the overall war. We reached out to the Vatican for comment, but we have not heard back. Jeff? He mentioned the statute of limitations has expired in most of these cases. Is, is there any recourse then for so many of these victims? There is a bill on the table here in the Pennsylvania state legislature that could eliminate the statute of limitations for one year, so any victim could file a civil lawsuit regardless of age. Jeff? All right, Nikki Batiste leading us off tonight from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Nikki, thank you. So, um, 
as the news broke of this story, and I, I read a little bit more about it, and I, I won't share details, but you, you can certainly read about the indictments and the report just from one state. Um, I thought, we, we need to talk about some of this. Uh, we need to take what's in the dark and bring it to the light, uh, not only because uh, there are people here who have been abused. I, I know of three specific stories, but I'm sure there are more here. Um, three specific stories here. Three people, a, a part of our church community, who have been abused sexually by a pastor or a church leader. And I'm sure there's more. And uh, we can, as Protestants, point fingers at the Catholic Church, but that gets us nowhere because I, I think that probably things are just as bad probably where we're at as well. And we have to talk about it. We have to provide a place for people who have been abused to know that they are loved in spite of the worst things that have happened to them. So I, I want to say, for those of you that have been abused, maybe by a pastor, maybe not, maybe just abused by someone in authority, uh, State Street is a church where those who have been hurt by abuse find compassion and people ready to travel patiently alongside of you. Um, if you've been abused, know that we are here for you. And, and it's hard to trust churches again. The people I know that were abused by churches, I, I, I am in constant awe of their faith that they haven't given up on the church, quite frankly. And St. Street's also a, a church where those who commit abuse are called to face human justice, to hear God's word of judgment and repent and believe the good news. Uh, too many times, over and over in the church, in the stories that I personally know, but also in the stories that are breaking the news, the church has decided to sweep these things underneath the rug, maybe because they don't want to ruin somebody's life, as they say, or maybe because they know that it will bring the church a bad name. And that's evil. That's wrong. Say Street's a church where all people are welcomed into open and secure communities that make known Christ's reconciling peace. I... Um, I think one of the hardest things about seeing what we just saw is that our knowledge of Jesus is often mediated through others. So the way you learn about faith is typically through somebody else. You learn about it through a parent or a grandparent or a pastor. And when that person who has taught you about faith, that has shared with you about God and abused that authority in your life, it's hard not to connect the very organization that they, that they connect themselves to, to faith in general. I'm less worried about people who abandon the faith. I'm more worried about people who say, I'm done with it because of the way the church is. And um, as a pastor, as someone in authority who takes it very, very seriously, the role that I have in your life and the role I have in the community here at large, we ought not ever to, to sweep things under the rug. Now, you might be wondering as you hear this, what kind of policies we have here at State Street um, to make sure that these things don't happen. And our children's director, Julie Secor, is very, very um, very, very uh, cautious about these things. So you'll notice that um, in our classrooms, there's always two adults. There's never just one adult. Um, we have very uh, important guidelines for background checks, these kind of things. Again, like the priest said, you can never mitigate it completely, but we do everything we can to make sure that it doesn't happen here. We, we try to uh, create the right policies of, of protection because we believe that children learn about Jesus and God and love and holiness and, and, and beauty through adults. And our knowledge of Jesus is mediated to them. I, um, I want you to know 
if you were abused sexually, physically, emotionally, mentally in a church, that's not from God. And that's hard to hear and that's hard to say because you can say, well, clearly these people seem to take their faith seriously and they still abused people. But I can tell you for sure that is not the way of Christ. Matthew 18, this is the words of Jesus. And Jesus, as compassionate and loving and gracious as Jesus is, he doesn't kind of mince words here. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones, before these children, if you cause one of these children to doubt their faith or to doubt a God that loves them, to look at the institution of the place that proclaims that God is love, if you are the one that causes that stumbling block, it would be better for you if a, a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. Jesus very seriously very kind of resolutely says, if you are the one getting in the way of the faith of a child, and don't mistake, that's what abuse does, then judgment comes to you. It's painful. It's painful as a pastor for me to see people uh, trusted with the sacred task of showing God's love, abusing that trust. There is nothing in my life that I I, I really take more seriously than demonstrating the love of God to my family, to you, to the community around us. And when we abuse that role, when we demonstrate that we don't take that role seriously, but by abusing those who are on the margins, those who are weak, those who are part of being an other, those who can't speak for themselves. It's painful. I don't know about you, but I hear these stories. And many of my friends that I grew up with, friends that I had in youth group, they've given up on the church. And, And they add these stories to the long list of reasons why that Wait a second. It doesn't look like the church is any different than the organizations that don't proclaim God's love. So why would I go to a church? And I want you to know I haven't given up on the church. I haven't. And I hope you haven't either. Even though everything in me sometimes says, I'm done. I cannot believe this. Because this isn't the only thing that happened. There were... uh, There were... uh, Popular megachurches in the last month have lost pastors because of uh, abusing their role as, as a pastor and, and uh, having affairs and, and taking advantage of women and things like that. And, and when you read this and see this, you think, what in the world are we doing? But I haven't given up. And I hope you don't either. We're going to be looking at a section of the creed today. We're going to start in the second section. And we're going to look at the part about Jesus. And the reason I don't give up on the church is because I don't give up on Jesus. And Jesus hasn't given up on me. So we're going to look at the creed today. Last week we talked about Uh, This section here, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We talked about God bringing order into the chaos of this world, which is kind of crazy when you see God's people bringing more chaos and disorder because that's the very opposite thing that God instructs us to do. But I believe in this God. I believe in this God that loves his children like a parent, whose love is as strong as as any hate or evil that can be committed. 
who creates goodness and love out of the mix of the mess that we create. Then we get to the second part. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. The the creed ends, I believe, in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I imagine that that second line is going to be really hard to say for some people. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church. But I haven't given up. I haven't given up. When we look at the story of Jesus, we look here that the creed says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, God's son, our Lord. Now this word Lord is a a uniquely Roman term. It was like a nobility term. People in authority got that term. People with power and privilege got that term term they were lords it's given to people that have authority it's given to people that have power you you might say that uh, another word for this as as shane claiborne says is president it's like you know jesus is president jesus is lord he he has dominion over the world when we say that jesus is lord it means that we recognize that he is the only one with power and authority to bring love and justice that actually restores and renews creation. If you want to see how a person truly is, look at them when they have power and authority. Right? Give them a little bit of power, give them a little bit of authority, and now look at them and see how they truly are. my 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 children, right? They're they're six, eight, and ten. Uh, greatest kids I've ever had. Um, but whenever uh, I put my daughter in charge of the two boys, right, the authority goes to her head very quickly, and the power, right, corrupts, and she becomes kind of like Miss Bossy Pants and you know, frustrated at her brothers for not, you know, following every word that she says. And uh, funnily enough, expects more out of them than we expect out of her. Um, But authority can do that. It can show what a person is like, you know, when they have power and privilege and money and things like that, what they're truly like. Here's, Here's what amazes me about Christ as I explore the scriptures. As in the midst of chaos, I hold tight to the words of Christ. In the midst of abuse, I look to the one who comforts and brings peace, even when his people don't. Even with all power, even with all authority, even holding the world in his hand, whole world in his grasp can do anything he wants can say and and cause anything he wants Jesus never devalues people never never all authority all power never devalues people never makes people feel like others never marginalizes or oppresses never in all authority in all power He gives it back to the people. He makes himself weak. He gets mocked and ridiculed. He suffers with those who are suffering. He mourns with those who are mourning. He gives his life so that people can have it. Jesus raises people up because this is a resurrection faith. He never devalues people. So when the church devalues people, people. 
when the church abuses people, when the church makes people feel that they're other or less than them, that they abuse their authority, that does not come from Jesus. That is not the way of, that is not the way of Christ. Jesus never devalues people. Again, think about people who get a little power, a little authority. Maybe it's in politics. Maybe it's they got a promotion. M- maybe they, you know, are working somewhere where they get to kind of lord it over other people. Your boss. They got, they, they got that, like, one promotion, and they think they're all that, you know? And you're like, you were literally, like, with us a week ago. Who do you think you are? Think about what Jesus could have done. But he doesn't. He has all authority. He has all power. He has all wisdom. He has every reason to. But he doesn't. Because Jesus looks into people and recognizes their humanity. The image of God within them. He comes among them and recognizes that even in a world that brings chaos, that it's, it's love, it's God's love that can bring order. Even when the religious people of the day, just like in Jesus' time, abuse God's authority and look nothing like Jesus. Jesus is still there. The presence of Christ mourns with you when you've been abused. I, um, I think the church is at an interesting season. We're, of course, in the Me Too movement. We're, uh, we've been in this movement of the church making sense of abuse. Now, don't get me wrong. Most of these abuses happened in 2002 and earlier. But, I, I, again, it happens. I know people here who have been abused. Every one of them in this church, the three that I know about, no repercussions to their abuser. Even when they said something, even when they turned them in, no repercussions. They were told to be quiet. You don't want to ruin their life. But nobody, nobody said, but what about the life that you've ruined with them? Jesus never devalues people. I um w- w- when when I lose faith in the church when I lose faith that God's people are actually being a part of of reconciling love and justice in this world I come back to Christ See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That that God loves us so much that he calls us children. There's a quote by David uh, Steindl Rost that talks about how to follow Jesus and how to make sense of it. And he says, now Jesus taught by word and deed that God's power was the power of love. Thus, when the early Christians said God is love, as they do in the Scriptures, they proclaimed the absolute, universal, and intimately personal authority of love, that only Jesus has the authority to say that God is love, and He does. They had experienced God's love personified, as it it were, in Jesus Christ, Following him meant standing up with him in the power of love against any other power in the world. Because he represented that divine power, they could dare give him the title Lord. The title of the God whose power is love. So when we say, 
I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. We give Jesus the title of Lord of Love, who has authority over those who abuse. Who says that that is not the way that I've created this world to live. That is not love. That is not self-sacrificial, gracious, compassionate love. Being a Christian means we trust that Jesus is Lord. Right? That, that was really the earliest proclamation of faith is Jesus is Lord, right? We've since then, you know, done lots of different like theological quizzes and tests and you know, acts of fidelity and these kind of things. But earliest is, is Jesus is Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord, then your life will be different, right? If you have faith that Jesus is Lord, things are different. Because faith in Jesus Christ as Lord means two things. It means trusting in the power of God's transformative love, that God's love transforms the world, transforms you, transforms the people around you. But it also means that we face up to the demands of such love by living accordingly. That God has called us to live in love. Not just to proclaim it, but to live it. When we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, it's not just a proclamation with our voice. It's a, a proclamation with our life. Because Jesus is Lord, then love has won. He has the authority to declare that chaos and darkness and abuse and oppression and marginalization is no longer the way of this world, the way of God the way of restoration. And by God's love, we're transformed. I, um, I only want one thing today. I want one thing, and, and that's it. It's for those of you who have been walking silently because maybe you've been abused, and maybe... Maybe this story this week has brought out something in you. Maybe you've been abused by people in the church and uh, you've never told anybody and that's okay. You don't need to tell me. That's not what this is. I hope you do work on that and hope, I hope you do feel that you can trust somebody with that story. Um, but what I, I want you to know, and I hope you hear this, even if there's just one person in here, this sermon's for you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the abuse that you've went through. At the hands of people who were entrusted to show you the love of God. The evil that they've committed. There's no excuse. I'm sorry. And I hope, I hope that you find in this community a place that recognizes that the love of God transforms. For whatever reason, you've not given up on the church. You have a faith stronger than most. But I hope you find that this is a place not of abuse, but of restoration. That the abuse at the hands of people you trusted were not the hands of Christ. And I, I want to give you this commitment before we end here. I want to I give you this commitment in the Lord that I believe in, that we worship, that we affirm in the creeds, this Jesus. I, I, I want to give you this. As a community of faith, we will not forget those who are hurting. Whether they're here in LaPorte, whether they're here in Pennsylvania, whether they're at Willow Creek in Chicago, we will not forget those who are hurting. We will listen carefully. 
And we understand that those among us who suffer, that there are those among us who suffer in silence. For whatever reason, you carry that burden silently. And so, we will not further silence our neighbor with platitudes or should have. We will not blame you. We commit to hold your pain gently. We know we must continue to challenge the power dynamics in our world that make abuse prevalent. Even when these dynamics and systems benefit us. We will not worship ideas or institutions. We will love God and love our neighbor above all else. We struggle to understand how the world can be so broken. But we will not let this deter us from seeking justice. We will not cease praying for his kingdom come. We commit ourselves to the journey ahead. Our friend, you who have been abused sexually, emotionally, physically, by the church, will walk alone no longer. Amen. We're going to work into a time of Eucharist where we give thanks for the good and gracious gift that is Jesus. And um, my, my, my prayer here is that we take this time to reflect on our faith and our life and maybe we need to center it back on Jesus. Maybe we've put our, our faith in the wrong things. Maybe we put it in a pastor or we put it in a, a parent or we put it in a leader. And that leader has maybe abused that trust. And, and we, we place our faith now in Christ who loves perfectly, who demonstrates profound grace and mercy to his creation. And we repent of the areas of our life where we've chose the path of hate and chaos and abuse over love, peace, and justice. Perhaps you've been a part of an institution that bought, brought brokenness to this world. M maybe as you look back, you can say, yeah, I didn't handle this well as a leader in a church or in a faith community. Maybe, maybe it's time to make peace with that and with those who perhaps were hurt. Maybe you've been carrying around and you've tried to just put it down within you, the hurt that you've experienced in a church by the hands of maybe a grandparent or a parent or a youth leader, a pastor, a priest. I pray you know that whatever you're feeling, whatever you're dealing with is safe in the hands of Christ. As we enter into this Eucharist, as we give thanks for the good and gracious gift that is Jesus Christ, will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. The tables of Christ are open.